G'day, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the third season of the History in the Bible podcast. In this final season, I explore how the Jews and the Christians constructed new religions when they were sent spinning into the void after the destruction of the temple. All of the history about all of the books beyond the Bible. Episode 3.25 Remaking Paul Part 2 Luther and Beyond In the last episode, I discussed how Irenaeus liberated Paul from the Marcionites and Gnostics. I also introduced one of the most popular Christian books of the early medieval period, The Acts of Paul and His Virtuous Acolyte Thecla. Before I continue, let me present a lengthy sidebar and introduce you to some of the tricks of the historical trade. Bear with me. A century ago, most scholars doubted the existence of a single unified work called the Acts of Paul. The professors possessed a number of separate Greek language chunks from medieval times that seemed to be related, works called the Acts of Paul and Thecla the martyrdom of Paul, and Paul's third letter to the Corinthians. Were all these fragments one single big book? Through the 20th century, scholars uncovered more manuscripts. Several Greek papyri, and a Coptic papyrus from late antiquity. All were considerably older than the medieval works. These fragments confirmed that there was indeed once a single document incorporating all the medieval pieces, the Acts of Paul. Scholars are now confident that we have recovered about half of the original Acts of Paul. But hang on, hang on, hang on. How can we know that? If we only have bits and pieces, how can we possibly determine the length of the original? To answer that, let me reintroduce the Codex Claramontanus. You can hear a lot, lot more about the Codex in my episode 2.24, Battle for the New Testament, Part 4, Modern Times. It's a fascinating story, and well worth your time. A Codex is simply a book, as opposed to a scroll. Claramontanus is a collection of Paul's letters. It is a polyglot, Greek and Latin. The Codex is dated to the very early Byzantine Empire, somewhere between 400 and 600. In the late 1500s, the Calvinist scholar Theodore Beza procured the book from a shop in the French town of Clermont. Hence its name. This was a time when adventurous Protestant scholars had shaken off the medieval shackles imposed by the church, and were eagerly searching for exciting old manuscripts. Beza didn't know what to make of Claramontanus. The manuscripts of the letters were strikingly different to all the other Greek manuscripts he had. Beza decided they were weird aberrations. Claramontanus contains a riveting addendum to Paul's letters, a stichometry. Well... Riveting to biblical scholars, but they are easily excited. The name stochometry is fancy, but the concept is very simple. A stochometry is a catalogue of books, together with the length of each book in standard scribal lines. The number of lines helps a copyist to estimate the amount of parchment, time and money needed to copy a book. The stochometry lists several books, that did not make it into our New Testament canon. The Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Acts of Paul, and the Revelation of Peter. The author clearly thought of these as just as holy as the Gospels. According to the stichometry, the Acts of Paul was about 3,600 lines long. For comparison, it records the books of Exodus, Numbers, and Isaiah as about the same length. Thanks to the stichometry, we have an excellent estimate 
of the length of the original book, The Acts of Paul. The material we have recovered so far is only about 2,000 lines long. And that is why scholars are confident that we have recovered about half of the original work. Had the Acts of Paul made it into the New Testament, the volume would have been half again lengthier than the longest book in our New Testament, our book of Acts. Ah, where was I? Back to the Acts of Paul and his adoring student, Thecla. Thecla became a household name in the Christian world. Pilgrims flocked to her shrines in Asia Minor, Syria and Egypt. We have depictions of Thecla on flasks, paintings and gravestones. Followers committed their lives to her devotion. Revered as a saint, she competed with Mary, mother of Jesus, as the most important person outside the Trinity. Even today, you can find plenty of churches named for Saint Thecla. Thecla had defied her family, her betrothed, the legal system and all social convention, just as Paul wanted her to do. Running throughout the story is the message of Paul's authentic letters, encapsulated in this passage from his letter to the Galatians. Quote, Galatians 3.28 There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. End quote. In Paul's six authentic letters, women are respected and important leaders in the clubs he founded. Recall that this was a time in which women were homebodies and nobodies in both Roman and Jewish society. The sole function of women was to reproduce and care for men. They were invisible in public life. You know, come to think of it, in a lot of places nothing has changed. Paul followed the example of Jesus. As recounted in the Gospels, the life of Jesus is remarkable, if not unique, in antiquity, for the prominence it gives to women. Even more extraordinary, the women are named. Compare that to the Jewish Mishnah, which was gestating when the early Christian literature was produced. If the Mishnah contains the name of a single woman of the time of its compilation, I have yet to find it. But I have to give credit to much later rabbis who went some way to remedying this. Women were amongst Jesus' travelling retinue. Women supported his mission. Most notably, of all Jesus' followers, only women were present at Jesus' death. Women were the first to deliver the news that Jesus was no longer in his tomb and the first to proclaim that Jesus had been raised. In his authentic letters, Paul is adamant that men and women are equal. Paul often names his female colleagues. Women can preach, baptise and teach, just as well as men. These ideas were an outrageous slap in the face to traditional Roman and Greek conceptions of the family. Later pagans attacked the Christians for their female leaders. The patriarchal household was a basic social structure in ancient society. Man runs the house. Man owns everyone in the house. The household is a rigid hierarchy. Pater familias on top, then his sons, then his sons, then their sons, then women, and then slaves. In letters written many years after Paul's death, Paul is made to denounce his previous views. These are the pastoral letters to Timothy and Titus. For a long discussion on them, hearken back to episode 2.52, the many puzzles of Paul's epistles. Here is 1 Timothy. Quote, 1 Timothy 2.11 Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. End quote. 
thanks to uncertainties in dating, we do not know if the pastoral letters were written before the Acts of Paul or the other way around. Most scholars think that one was a reaction to the other. Perhaps the Acts of Paul was written as an attack on the pastorals. Or perhaps the pastorals were written to neutralise the Acts of Paul. Whatever the case, by the year 200, church fathers were weaponising the pastorals to oppose female leadership positions and cajole women back into traditional roles. You can find more information in episode 3.8, After the Temple Part 2, The Christians. It is all so sad. For a single century after the death of Paul, Christianity had the opportunity to fashion a religion that equally valued and valorised the sexes, liberating women from ancient and oppressive constraints. Through the rest of antiquity, right up to the Reformation, Paul's letters were honoured and uncontroversial documents. Martin Luther gave them a new interpretation. He used them as weapons to attack both Judaism and the Catholic Church he came to despise. Luther believed that the Church had perverted the original intentions of Jesus, his disciples and Paul. The Church held that God had given these early Christians only a portion, a deposit of divine truth. God had used the Church to expand this small deposit into a mine of holiness. Luther vehemently argued that this was bunk. We must discard all writings of the Fathers, all the rules of the Church, all the corruptions that the Church had created. We must return to the truths revealed in the scriptures and the scriptures alone. This is the doctrine of sola scriptura. The church taught that God would balance your good deeds against your bad when deciding if heaven or hell was to be your eternal destination. No matter the sins you had committed, you could wipe them from the books with good works. The rich were in prime position to take advantage of this theological loophole. No matter how many were your marital misdeeds, no matter how often you lashed your tenants, no matter how many people you had killed, you could wipe all these from the books, build a chapel, found a monastery, provide charity to the people you had brutalised. Bingo! God now loved you. Martin Luther had other ideas. He refused to believe that Jesus and Paul could construct so vulgar a system of reward and punishment. Luther held that the Jews of Paul's time believed that salvation had to be earned by following the law. Saul the Jew believed that. But Paul the Christian proselytizer discovered that his efforts to follow Torah had led him into greatest sin. Paul would only be saved by placing his faith in Jesus. Paul had been called by the pure favour of God. As an act of unmerited salvation, God mercifully pardoned Paul for his opposition to the work of Christ. Paul did not choose God. God chose Paul. Luther found all this in Paul's letter to the Romans, his critical and key text and later in many other passages in the letters. Luther turned the letter to the Romans into the central book of the Bible. That it was the first and longest of the letters in the canon only reinforced its high place in Luther's eyes. Quote, Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. End quote. Luther decided that salvation, heaven, derives from faith alone, a sheer belief in Jesus that expects no reward. You won't be saved by anything you do, by works. 
You won't be saved by being baptised or going to confession or doing penance. You are not saved because you belong to a church community and follow that community's rules. Your community, your church will not save you. Being a member of the Catholic or Orthodox churches will not save you. Only you can save you. Individuals, not churches, are saved by God's free act of grace. Luther used Paul to launch a twofold assault. First, Luther contended that Paul was attacking Jewish legalism. Jews, Luther believed, held that to follow the law was to be virtuous. End of story. Second, Luther used Paul to argue that you're not saved by Roman Catholic rules. Sending money to the Pope in Rome won't get you a place in heaven. Luther cemented into the burgeoning Protestant movement the perception of Paul as an opponent of both Judaism and also the established churches. After Luther, analysis of Paul and his letters was put on the back burner for centuries. Catholics and Orthodox had their way of interpreting Paul and the Protestants theirs. All believed that Paul's letters were theological treatises, a revealed body of truth. They just disagreed as to what that truth was. In the late 1970s, some Protestant scholars began a project to rescue Paul from Martin Luther. This eventually became known as the New Perspective on Paul approach. The three leading lights in this movement were the Texan Ed Parrish Sanders of Duke University, James D.G. Dunn, a professor at the University of Durham in England, and Tom Wright, Bishop of Durham. These academics were also prominent in the third quest for the historical Jesus movement. To catch up on that, rewind to my episode 2.25, The Quest for the Historical Jesus. The new perspective approach pits these Protestant scholars against other Protestant professors. Most Catholic and Orthodox intellectuals wonder what all the fuss is about. They applaud that the new perspective could bring the Protestant churches into alignment with many of their own views. The new perspective scholars argue against some of their fellows that Luther got it all wrong. Luther not only misinterpreted Paul, he misunderstood the Judaism of Paul's time. Luther argued that Paul disdained the easy and mindless rule following that the Jews thought would earn them God's good graces. Luther extended that to condemn the easy and mindless loopholes that Catholicism provided. Against Luther, the new perspective scholars hold that the Judaism of that time was not a mechanical legalism. Jews did not observe the law to gain God's favour. They already had God's favour. God had made a covenant with his people. God's obligation was to treat the Jews well. In return, the Jews were obliged to follow God's laws. The New Perspective scholars argue that Paul did not oppose Christian grace to Jewish legalism. Paul simply argued that just because you were Jewish did not inevitably mean that you were in God's good books. Anyone could achieve God's favour. Paul only talks about salvation through faith when speaking to Gentiles. Paul has no objection to Jewish fans of Jesus from following the law. But Paul does insist that those parts of the law that separate Jews from pagans, such as food regulations and purity rules, do not apply to the pagans. Let me conclude my ponderings on Paul. How important was Paul to Christianity? In the first third of the 20th century, critical study of the New Testament was dominated by German Protestant professors. For more on them, treat yourself to a yummy shawarma for lunch while you re-listen to my episode 2.25, The Quest for the Historical Jesus. 
These scholars increasingly viewed Paul as Christianity's real founder. By the middle of the 20th century, after all these professors had retired or died, Paul's status as the true founder of Christianity was a hot topic in the ivy-covered halls. The academic trend today is to dismiss the idea as overblown. True, Paul claimed to have received independent revelations direct from Jesus. But as Paul says in his letters, he derived his basic information from the Jerusalem club of Peter and James. Now, Paul must have zoned out in many of those conversations. Peter and James no doubt chatted endlessly about their experiences with the living Jesus. Yet in his letters, Paul shows not a scintilla of interest in Jesus' life. For more on that, travel back to episode 2.48. Do you think you're what they say you are? We cannot in all justice regard Paul as a founder, or second founder, of Christianity. But we can acclaim him as the man who saved Christianity from extinction. Jesus found his own followers in the Jews of Galilee, then in his brief later ministry in Judea. He also made the odd non-Jewish convert in Samaria and amongst the Romans. The book of Acts tells us that people of many nations were converted by the disciples. At Pentecost alone, the disciples' audience contained Persians, Medians, Elamites, and people from Asia Minor, Crete, Egypt, and Libya. These converts may have come from many regions, but Acts implies that they were all diaspora Jews. In Acts, the only unequivocal example of a pagan conversion before Paul's missions is Peter's conversion of the Roman centurion Cornelius. Now I cover that in episode 2.49, Stephen and the conversion of Cornelius. It is quite possible the story was created to show that Peter could do anything Paul could do. Paul's letters show us a man who would always expound to the local Jewish community first. Paul's prickly personality invariably repelled them. Paul would then preach to the pagans, who interpreted his uncompromising character as the stamp of a great philosopher. And so, quite inadvertently, Paul became the great apostle to the Gentiles. There must have been others, but they have vanished into the mists of history. If you believe Acts, Paul's mission to the pagans was of one accord with the mission of the Holy Jewish Jerusalem Club of Peter and James. Now, I and most scholars don't believe that for a second. Paul's letters show that he struggled against heated opposition from Jerusalem. Paul unintentionally created a path for the Christian movement to survive the destruction of the temple and the Judean state that occurred less than a decade after his death. By creating congregations full of pagans, he saved his clubs from the misery and terror that befell the Jewish-only Jesus clubs. Paul quarantined his foundations from the Judean nationalistic struggle that sought the overthrow of its Roman masters. Paul's pagan clubs cared not a whit about the Judean quixotic battles for political independence. Paul himself certainly had no quarrel with the Romans. More than that, Paul fortuitously constructed a theology that others later interpreted as saying that Gentiles could achieve salvation, heaven, without having to follow the Jewish law. We cannot know if Paul's theology was original or if he was riffing off notions already floating around. In the next episode, I present The Christian Literary Eruption. Thanks for visiting. For show notes, maps, charts, and timelines, visit my website at www.historyinthebible.com. You can even download professional posters for free.